Hi, great to see everyone here. My name is Roman. I'm an undergraduate computer science major at the University of Texas at Dallas and the co-founder of our EA student group. I got into EA about a year ago, and I'm primarily interested in doing things that reduce the chance that everyone dies from misaligned, super intelligent AI systems. Tentatively, I've been reading up about AI alignment, and that's about it. All right. So I made a post a few months ago called Tools for Finding Information on the Internet. I've been browsing the web for a number of years now and tinkering around with different pieces of software for about the same time. And I've built up a small collection of things that I use to surf the web. And I didn't think it was going to be too useful because I thought some of these tools, more people would have heard about them, but apparently people liked it. And that's why I'm here to talk to you guys today. The internet is not like a super intelligent, truthful oracle. It's like a weird system that you have to learn to navigate. It's like a deep forest. Like any explorer, everyone deserves a map and a compass in order to navigate it more effectively. And so that's what I hope to provide today is like a map and a compass and then some extra content at the end. The first tool I'll go over is metaphor.systems. This is a search engine that uses natural language processing to help you find links. And it does it in a pretty unique way. Unlike most other search engines, you don't type in a prompt into the search bar that's like a question or anything. You pretend as if you are about to share a link with a friend. So you preface it with what you would then link to. Here's a real example of something I was looking for a few weeks ago. I was curious about how to format blog posts to make them more accessible and like skimmable. And when you search this on Google, you'll find probably like a bunch of blog spam. So like seven blog formatting tips to better engage your readers. Like, no, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something from like 2007 that's terribly formatted or like with bare HTML. It's like really opinionated, you know? And I actually did end up finding some quality links from metaphor.systems like this one, which is nice, as well as this one from 2007. And it's kind of exactly what I was looking for. Someone talking about chunking information, all this stuff. And you aren't going to find something like this on Google. The next thing is perplexity.ai. It also uses natural language processing to answer information. And what it does is it takes text from search results and then kind of conjoins it together into an answer for you. In this case, I'm asking about the dot product of two vectors and what that says about the angle between them. And then it takes text from these different websites and then instantly presents it to you. You could also do this with Bing search or Bing chat, but I've found perplexity to be a little more accurate. The next section, I'm going to talk about bypassing restrictions to finding information. So sometimes you'll know what link you want to go to, but it's blocked somehow. Suppose the link doesn't work anymore. Here's a real doozy of a URL from 2012 that I stumbled across somewhere. And if you type this in the URL bar, it redirects to observer business. So not actually what I'm looking for, but you can use what's called the Wayback Machine from the Internet Archive, which archives old instances of the website. And then you can see it here. Now, the last section is finding high quality information, finding trustable information. Sometimes it's really difficult to find quality information about specific topics, specifically product recommendations and nutrition advice. If you search on Google, like top 10 toothbrushes, you're probably going to pull up a bunch of blog spam articles and you don't really know whether you can trust them. You don't know whether it's actually hosted by a toothbrush company that's going to put theirs at the top. Consumer Reports is a website which reviews products and gives you recommendations and things. And it's very specifically doesn't have any industry ties, isn't like paid off or anything. So it's just generally very trustworthy product recommendations. But I do believe you have to become a member. That's how they make money, of course, not by advertising, but by people paying for the information. And I think that's totally fair. And for nutrition information, nutrition science is already really difficult to learn about. And then you have a bunch of blog articles trying to sell you supplements, even websites that don't have alternative incentives. You have to be really careful about nutrition science and science in general because of replicability reasons and things. And so examine.com is a website that has, well, trustworthy information about supplements. For example, let's learn about creatine. And it summarizes a bunch of info about it. I believe they take information from the Cochrane Review. And again, you have to pay for more information, but that makes total sense because they don't sell supplements and they don't sell advertisements and things. Now I'm going to go over some information for academics. And this was suggested to me by a less user named Gears to Ascension or Lauren. I don't have as much experience with these, 
Archive Explorer is a semantic search engine for archive. So you can search transformers, okay, survey transformers and see more papers like any given paper. They find it useful for doing AI alignment research. They also like Semantic Scholar, which can also do this thing where you add the papers that you enjoy to your reading list, and then it suggests you more papers to read. And then Paperscape, again, I don't have any experience with this, to be honest, but I guess you can view the different citation graph of papers, so that's useful. And then Elicit is a website that I personally use when I'm curious about things that I can only really find from looking up papers. This is maintained by a company called Ott, which is kind of AI alignment related, but not really. Suppose you wanted to figure out the impact of creatine on cognition. Elicit uses natural language processing to do a bunch of fancy things like summarize the abstract and pull out other information about the paper that you can quickly browse. I especially like the filters that it has. For example, I'll usually do meta-analyses and systematic reviews, which typically are more high quality information. So, oh great, a systematic review of randomized control trials. Oh, that's perfect. That is just so epistemically good. Like I know I can trust this paper now. And that might've taken a lot longer to find on something like Google Scholar. The real cool thing is you can star different papers that are kind of what you're looking for. And then you can clear the unstarred ones and it'll generate more suggestions. If the papers that you find aren't answering the exact question that you're looking for, but maybe a couple of them do, that's how you can generate more suggestions. Now that you have a map and a compass for finding information on the internet, navigating this jungle, you might think to yourself, okay, what else do I need when I'm going on this journey? Well, every explorer knows that you also need to pack things like mosquito repellent, mosquito nets, etc., to dissuade annoyances, to dissuade bugs and things that might bite you. A similar thing is true for navigating the internet. There are all these pop-ups and advertisements and things that are trying to steal your attention, trying to distract you. So I'm going to go over three broad strategies for getting over this. The first is uBlock Origin. Ublock Origin is an ad blocker, and it's kind of the canonical best ad blocker for people who know what they're doing because it's completely free and open source. And unlike other ad blockers like Adblock Plus, advertising companies can't pay the developer of it to let certain ads through. If you're using Adblock Plus right now, I recommend you switch to Ublock Origin and you might see less ads. One especially cool thing about Ublock Origin is that it's not just an ad blocker. It's also a general purpose content blocker. So suppose you're using Elicit and you don't like this little box in the corner, add information about all papers. Well, you can use their element zapper, which allows you to select an element to just get rid of. And usually you'd use that for sidebars that suggest more articles to read or sometimes advertisements like hard-coded advertisements, that sort of thing. Of course, they come back when you reload the page, but you can use their element picker, which is another tool to get rid of it forever. And then there are tools for like selecting exactly which element you want. So we're going to block that. And then when I reload the page, it disappears. And what's especially nice is suppose you're using Facebook and you come across suggested people or like suggested other posts. And this was something that uBlock Origin didn't natively block. What's really cool about uBlock Origin is you can add other content blocking lists that other people have put together. So they come with some default ones, but you can also find some other ones online. So like this random person from Reddit created a Facebook ad blocker list. And so I added that to my block list on uBlock Origin. And now I don't see suggested posts, which is not a native Facebook feature. The general theme is you have autonomy over the websites that you view. Ultimately, they're just files that another computer sends to your computer that you then view using a web browser. And unless you're a software developer, I get the intuition that you might not realize that you get to control everything. You get to do whatever you want and control what websites show you. And so this is an example of a tool that you can use. The next is what are called user scripts. So they're kind of like browser extensions, but for smaller things. So I use the browser extension Violent Monkey to manage user scripts, but the most famous one is called Tamper Monkey or Greasy Fork or something. Anyway, these are smaller features that you can use that usually don't warrant an entire browser extension, but which you can manage with user script managers. For example, I have one called Don't Fuck With Paste, which all it does is prevents websites from fucking with your copy and pasting ability. 
So sometimes you'll come across some form and it's like, oh, type your email address a second time to confirm that you typed it really correctly. And then you try to copy what you typed in the original because you're sure you typed the right one and paste it into the other, but it actually blocks you from pasting because it's like, mm, I don't want you to mess it up this time as if you can't try again with a new account or something if you typed it in wrong. Anyway, don't fuck with paste. All it does is just prevents them from doing that. And you can find user scripts at userscript.zone to add all sorts of small functionality as well as Greasy Fork is another search engine, which is how I found this one. The third and last tool I'll talk about for having more autonomy over the websites that you view is actually just a class of websites. So these are alternative front ends or like privacy focused front ends. An example of this is libreddit, which is a website that takes the information from the homepage of Reddit or whatever specific subreddit and then provides an alternative way to view it. If I go to the actual main Reddit homepage, it takes a lot longer to load and you have ads. And then like, suppose you're looking at a post and then usually in the sidebar, there's suggested posts and you have to be logged in and all this stuff. And if you're logged out, it'll like prompt you to log in. It's just kind of annoying. Or you can just cut through everything and use libreddit. And then proxy talk is like another example of this. Suppose you have TikTok link that you want to look at instead of going to the actual TikTok homepage and risk falling down the rabbit hole of TikTok. This is like an alternate front end for that. It's a proxy. So this is a random person, a football player. And so it shows you a TikTok from them. And it's not designed to suck you into an endless stream of terrible content. And then I use a browser extension called libredirect, which in theory, if you visit a web page, it should automatically redirect you to the corresponding alternative front end service. And so this is the list of all of them that exist. And so those are all the tools that I wanted to talk about that I had prepared. But if anyone has any questions, I would love to chat more about this. Super cool. Thank you. My mind has been expanded significantly. <laughs> I only have Perfect. heard of a handful of these, so getting the tour is really helpful. So I'm curious when you're looking through some of these different like scripts that you can add, yeah. uh, are there particular things that you do to make sure they're safe? That's a good question. Yeah. Because these are random scripts online. Like this one looks really sus. YouTube ad blocker, block all ad. Okay. I don't know whether this is safe. You're right. The cool thing about user scripts is by definition, they're open source. So you can look at the script itself, or you can just look at the script itself. And I usually just browse the source code before I add some random person script to my entire web browser. And in this case, I'm not going to do that for this because it's a bit long. Yeah, that's what I do. Are there any things in particular that you look for or just like a general understanding of the code? Hmm. Yeah, just general understanding of the code. I've done some cybersecurity things, but I'm not like a cybersecurity expert. But I imagine if they're trying to do some suspicious stuff, it'd be kind of hard to hide. So I guess I look for calls to external URLs or if it's like scraping a password or something, if it's doing anything unrelated to what it's supposed to do. And you can also look at the feedback from other users. So this one is probably safe. I mean, actually, it looks like the author is the person that said it was good. So maybe it isn't safe. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. I, I do have one question. I'm thinking productivity wise, yeah. how much time slash amount of effort you've had to use less than you did before, perhaps time that was delayed by ads or time that was delayed by searching for a paper. Would you be able to like, not necessarily quantify, but give a sort of a rough estimate? That's a good question. To be completely honest, this has probably wasted more time than it's saved because it's enabled me to more efficiently browse the web instead of doing my homework or whatever. I mean, I've stumbled across a lot of interesting stuff, but almost always I just use this to answer random things I'm curious about and random things I've been thinking of, not necessarily anything super inherently productive. But I'm sure if someone's professional work actually involves finding info on the internet, this would probably be useful. Cool. Yeah, theoretically, you're saving all of us time and we'll be super productive. So you don't have to. Yeah, be. there's like I an offset, so. maybe. <laughs> but yes, this has been great. Yeah, of course. Hopefully this doesn't just enable you guys to browse the web more. <laughs> or maybe if you spend the same amount of time browsing the web, you get more out of it. That's a good wish. Yeah.
All right. Thank you guys so much for coming. Hopefully we'll see you around for future presentations and things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Bye. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Bye. Okay. Bye.